Welcome, fellow aviators, and welcome back to part three in this series. My name is Greg, and today's video will cover slow flight. To better understand what that involves, we'll start at the other end of the flight envelope. Pilots who love to tinker with their jets, swapping stock motors or turbines with more powerful ones, know that as they aim for higher speeds, the power increase wired is not linear. So if 100 miles per hour is the maximum speed with your current setup, an increase in speed to 150 miles per hour takes a lot more than a 50% increase in power out. In fact, it will take more than double, or 1.5 squared times the original power output. The key point here is that it takes an increase in power to go faster. We'll come back to this point later. The reason for that power increase is parasite drag, which increases exponentially as speed increases. Parasite drag is the total of form, interference, and skin friction drag that holds every plane back from freely expressing its inner bell. But even RC planes, like the Delta Jet here, are now inching closer to the sound barrier with a current speed of 750 kilometers per hour, or 466 miles per hour. As a soaring pilot, however, I'm thrilled to see the speed record recently set once again by Spencer Lysenby with a sailplane using dynamic soaring. The benefit of drag reduction was learned long ago, as seen in the evolution from the Ford Trimotor to the Douglas DC-3. Streamlining helps to reduce form drag, fairings between two connected surfaces help reduce interference drag, and a smooth skin reduces friction drag. You can see from the drag equation that parasite drag is proportional to the square velocity. So, as airspeed increases, parasite drag becomes the dominant force, second only to the FAA and AMA, that limits how fast U.S. jets can go. I have taken my stock Avanti up to its nominal design speed of 115 miles per hour, or 100 knots, true airspeed, which is the point where the thrust available curve hits the drag curve right here, at just under an estimated 3 pounds of total drag. If I had batteries with a better C rating than 30 that didn't sit unused in my basement for three years, I'm pretty sure I could have broken this drag barrier and added a few more knots. But I'm more interested in aerobatics than speed, and second only to that is greasing the perfect landing. That brings us to the other side of the flight envelope, which is slow flight. The dominant force here is induced drag. Like parasite drag, it also increases exponentially but in the opposite direction, as speed decreases. Induced drag is inseparable from lift. As a plane slows down, the angle of attack has to increase to maintain the same amount of lift. That changes the local flow of air over the wing, shifting the lift vector back. But induced drag is not just a vector component of lift that points aft. The physics to explain this is complicated, involving analysis, wind tunnel testing, and computations all based on the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. These tools make use of computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, the Navier-Stokes equations, the Biot-Savart law, 12 seconds later, Bernoulli, Euler, Newton, and much more, all far above my pay grade. A more intuitive explanation would be helpful, and I hope to address that in a separate video. Fortunately, we don't need to understand the physics in that much detail to fly. We just need to be aware of the exponential increase in drag as the plane slows down. This increase in drag is related in part to spanwise differences in lift generation. Vivanti makes use of different airfoils between the root and wing tip that generates a pressure gradient. Despite the use of wing fences and washout at the tips, it produces a spanwise flow of air captured here on one of my flights in misty conditions. Induced drag is also related to the large difference in pressure between the top and bottom of the wings. These differences join together not only at the wing tips, but at the trailing corners of flaps or any other abrupt change in the wing, generating a powerful trailing vortex that sucks energy from the plane. We change the angle of attack to a larger angle, that means we make lift, and there are the vortices. You see them very nicely. And 
Then you see at once how this vortex develops. You see very clear. First a picture where we see where the smoke comes out and we begin with no speed at all. The moment you see that the flow which came out underneath starts around the wing tip and to the top and forms behind this wing a vortex. Here we have, for instance, a condition where we have no lift. Now we increase the angle of attack and at once the rotational motion around the tip starts. And you see very distinct these particular flow lines. These vortices are strongest when the wing is working hardest. That happens when an aircraft is heavy, slow, and clean, as seen here with its quarter scale F 104 Starfighter. But even when gear and flaps are fully deployed, as captured here on a full scale airliner, if the airspeed is low and the angle of attack is high, Induced drag will be high as well. The resulting vortices are clearly visible in the clouds. Looking at the equation for induced drag, you can see its increase is inversely proportional to the square velocity. As V decreases, induced drag increases. This exponential increase, as speed decreases closer and closer to stall, is one reason energy management is so critical during this phase of flight. Even small changes in attitude now have a much more dramatic effect on the overall energy state of the plane. Watch the airspeed on the left as the pitch changes on my Avanti, raising the nose without adding thrust to compensate for the large increase in drag can cause the airspeed to drop very fast, leading to a stall. For this reason, flying with a high angle of attack requires focus and attention. When these two curves are added together, we get the total drag curve, the lowest point defining the one point in the flight envelope where drag is at a minimum. This point where the lift to drag ratio is greatest is simply referred to as L over D max. It is the best engine out glide speed. For turbine jets, this is also the green dot speed to borrow an Airbus term, or best endurance speed in a clean configuration. Looking at the drag curve in terms of power required, you can see that for prop and fan driven planes, the minimum power needed to maintain level flight is just to the left of L over D max. L over D max on the power curve is found by drawing a line from the origin to a point where it is tangent to the curve. Minimum power for level flight is also known as VX, or best endurance speed. Here's a rough graph of the power curve for my Avanti. Velocity, <coughs> in knots indicated airspeed, is plotted against throttle setting. There isn't much curve in this power curve. I suspect this may be due to the fact that the points are taken from more than one flight and at different times within a flight. So air densities and throttle settings would have been inconsistent due to differences in temperature and voltage. But you can see the best endurance speed is approximately 33 knots. Lining up the drag curve and power curve shows how both of these graphs are related. For both propeller and turbine driven planes, slow flight begins at the speed for best endurance. From this point all the way down to stall speed is known as the backside of the power curve. In this region, it takes more power to go slower. This is opposite of the normal response we get on the front side of the curve, where it takes more power to go faster. You can see in these short clips how the airspeed slows down, even though I'm increasing throttle while maintaining, or attempting to maintain, a constant altitude. You often hear that on the back side of the power curve, throttle controls altitude and pitch controls speed. That's true, but that's also a bit of a simplification. In fact, there are four flight regions during an approach, from low and slow to high and fast, that determine what control inputs or combination of inputs are needed. I will explain this in more detail with a demonstration when I cover glide slope in part five. To enter this region of the flight envelope, I use a simple, repeatable technique. First, 
reduced throttle at the start of the downwind leg. If I entered hot, then it's back to idle. If I was just cruising or entering from a go-around, then throttle is between 40 and 50 percent. Second, slowly add up elevator, about one millimeter total, while maintaining level flight. The exact amount will depend on the model. I use a preset trim that deploys over a period of four seconds. Without that, you will need to get a feel before takeoff how much stick movement this is. A preset trim in a separate flight mode, however, is much more precise <coughs> and will get you to the same speed every time. Now, hold this setting until unable to maintain level flight. Exceeding one millimeter by too much may lead to a stall. Practice at least one to three mistakes high to get the right trim setting. Three, add power back to maintain level flight. This is the upper boundary of slow flight and best endurance power setting. For my Avanti, that equates to about 22% on the throttle and 33 knots in a clean configuration. With gear down and flaps half, my throttle is between 40 and 50% and airspeed settles down to 30 knots. At this point, the plane is ready to turn onto base and begin its final descent. From this point until touchdown, as the aircraft continues to slow down, it will be in slow flight on the backside of the power curve. This is also known, somewhat misleadingly, as the region of reverse command. It's misleading in the sense that flight controls aren't reversed. Right stick will continue to work as it normally does to roll the plane to the right, and right rudder will yaw the nose to the right. Pushing down on the stick still makes the nose go down. What does change is how altitude and speed are managed. In fact, energy management is the best way to describe what we are trying to accomplish in this phase of flight. To land safely and minimize stress on the airframe and landing gear, the plane must be at the lowest energy state possible at touchdown. From the moment we enter the downwind leg, we need to work at reducing the total energy state of our plane while keeping it flying safely all through the approach. Let's pause for a moment and look at what energy state means. Energy state is simply the sum of an object's kinetic and potential energy. Kinetic energy is defined by an object's mass and speed potential energy by an object's mass and height above a surface. If we don't have better than a one-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio, we can trade kinetic for potential energy after accelerating first, then pulling up into a climb, rapidly gaining altitude but losing airspeed. If we don't throttle up during the climb, the energy state will be the same at the top as it was on the bottom of the climb, minus losses due to drag. We can then descend back to the same altitude as before, picking up kinetic energy while losing potential. There will be losses due to drag, so the energy state will once again be close, but not the same as it was before the dive. To overcome drag and maintain or increase the total energy state requires a third form of energy, chemical. This comes in the form of kerosene fuel for turbine jets and batteries for EDFs. By using chemical energy, we can generate the thrust needed to overcome drag, transferring the chemical energy in our tanks or batteries to kinetic or potential energy. You can see that kinetic energy is proportional to mass times the square of velocity. So with more mass, an object has more kinetic energy. Once again, velocity plays a bigger role. For airspeeds that we fly at, kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. For example, let's compare the 1.2 meter foam Avanti at three kilograms with its bigger sister, the 1.9 meter composite Avanti at nine kilograms. If the bigger Avanti with three times the mass were flying at 50 kilometers per hour, its kinetic energy would be 868 joules. If my little Avanti were flying at that speed, its kinetic energy would be only 289 joules, one third that of the bigger Avanti. But just double the speed to 100 kilometers per hour, and the small Avanti would now have a kinetic energy of 1,157 joules, or four times the energy it had at half the speed, and much greater than its more massive sister. So maybe size doesn't matter? When it comes to kinetic energy, it's airspeed that counts. Potential energy is a bit more straightforward. It's proportional to mass times height. So in this case, size does matter. If both Avantis were at the same altitude, the bigger one would have three times the potential energy of the smaller one. To put some numbers on it, let's find their potential energy at my typical downwind altitude of 33 meters. Multiplying mass times gravitational acceleration times height gives us 970 joules for the small Avanti 
and 2,911 joules for the bigger one. Notice that altitude contributes more than three times the energy that speed does to the energy state of the small Avanti, even though in this example, both altitude and speed are typical of the start of my approach. In order to achieve the ideal touchdown at or just above stall, I would need to reduce the energy state of my Avanti by more than 1,100 joules. By reducing my starting altitude to 23 meters, or 75 feet, I can lower my energy state before I even start my approach by almost 300 joules. That's significant. Okay, we're not going to be flying around with all of these numbers in our head, and if you've been flying for a while, you already have a good intuitive feel for the energy state of your plane. The goal on downwind should be to reduce energy state by starting at a good altitude, more on this in a minute, and slowing down to your best endurance speed. The point is to reduce kinetic energy or airspeed just enough to get on the back side of the power curve. Then we can safely begin to lose potential energy or altitude without gaining back any of the kinetic energy we just lost. Normally on the front side of the power curve a loss of altitude means a gain in airspeed unless throttle is reduced. But what if we're descending and already at idle? On the back side of the curve we can lose altitude without gaining airspeed by making use of induced drag as a form of aerodynamic braking, just as we might use it after touchdown to reduce speed, avoid excessive wear on the brakes. Induced drag keeps the overall energy state low enough to land safely. It's as effective as aerodynamic braking is on rollout to slow us down on approach. Scale airplanes powered by a big fan up front can use the prop itself for braking. If the plane is electric, then the ESC would need a braking feature, but that can work too. Prop braking, along with flaps, could be enough to control airspeed on the descent without ever getting into the backside of the power curve, making the approach perhaps a bit safer. With jets, we don't have that option. First, there is no fan up front. Second, the airframe is usually a bit more slippery in the air, making a dive toward the runway, even with full flaps, an exchange of potential for kinetic energy. In other words, there won't be enough drag to slow the plane down, and it will simply accelerate during the descent. For jets, without physical air brakes, to control airspeed on descent, we need the aerodynamic braking that induced drag provides. That is only possible in slow flight. Thus, the transition to slow flight is an important step to a successful approach. If it doesn't happen before the final descent of the runway, it will be hard to manage the energy state of the plane before touchdown. This is just another way to describe the approach that commercial flights take to a safe landing, a stabilized descent on a fixed glide slope. Notice the green dot speed must be met before beginning the final approach on this generic Airbus A330 approach guide. The final approach airspeed is below this green dot speed. Also, there is a minimum altitude to establish a stabilized descent. Notice the standard 3 degree glide slope on this approach plate for Miami International. When I cover the glide slope in part 5, I'll show why this may be too low of an angle for our model jets. Whether or not this is the best approach for model planes, with our light wing loading, low Reynolds numbers, lack of instrumentation, and susceptibility to turbulence and wind shear, it's really up to each pilot to decide. There's room for variation in alternate approaches, getting slowed down to a set airspeed close to VREF with a reasonable descent rate as early as possible on final. That's worked for me, allowing me to make the same stabilized approach at about the same speed and descent rate on almost every landing. I have used this method not only on the Avanti, which is a fairly easy jet to land, but on my pattern plane and several iMac planes. Of course, I think they are even easier to land than the Avanti, even though they have no flaps and don't provide airspeed. Notice the pitch attitude on all three airplanes. So what is the best speed to fly at once we turn from downwind to base? We can start with full-scale aviation as a guide as long as we recognize how the factors I just mentioned create some unique issues. I start with stall speed in the landing configuration, or VSO, and work from there. VREF is 1.3 times VSO. 
for my Avanti, that's 1.3 times 15, which is about 20 knots. That would be the absolute minimum approach speed. But that's simply not practical for the Avanti. I found that it's very hard to control below 20 knots. So using the other definition of VSO, which is minimum controllable airspeed, we get 1.3 times 20, which is 26 knots. This is a bit more reasonable and is close to the actual approach speed I typically fly. Since our light models don't have the inertia of full-scale planes, they can lose airspeed fast, much faster than we can react. Personally, I need time to recognize the signs of an impending stall. There's a slight delay in the reporting of indicated airspeed, so I programmed a warning that starts five knots above my stall speed. That warning is in the form of haptic feedback, also known as a stick shaker. It's my brain defogger, as it quickly gets my attention when I drop below. 21 knots. That has saved me a few times when my focus wandered and I let the plane get too slow. Another typical full-scale safety margin is to add one half of the headwind to your V-ref. So for a 10-knot headwind, add 5 knots to make it V-ref plus 5. If it's gusting from 10 up to 15 knots, creating possible wind shear, then add another 5 knots to make it V-ref plus 10. This would take the Avanti out of slow flight but the headwind will keep ground speed manageable at touchdown. My goal is to slow down to VRAF by the time I roll out onto final, then hold that until I begin my round out at the runway threshold. The round out will bring my speed down to 20 knots just as the plane begins to settle onto the runway. At that point, the flare begins and the remaining speed is bled off. In an ideal world, the stick shaker is going off as the mains settle onto the runway. That's it for this video. In part four, I'll look at the landing pattern and what to do and not do to avoid the danger zones. Until then, keep your wings in the air and your troubles on the ground. And oh yeah, grease one on for me.